Hello and welcome to our first episode of HCQ TV. I'm Melissa Fox, CEO of Health Consumers Queensland, and I'm your host for our series. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we are all gathered and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So I'll now throw to Dr Erin Evans, our board chair, to welcome you all on behalf of our board. Our annual forum has been an event that all of us look forward to each year, an opportunity for the consumer movement here in Queensland to gather, share success stories and celebrate. It was very sad decision to cancel it for 2020, although obviously a necessary one, because the health and well-being of you all is paramount to us. So rather than dwell on that loss, we have taken the opportunity to look at our organisational values for guidance on our next steps. We hope that our values of leadership, positive impact, fairness, innovation, partnership, and of course, zing and zest are evident in our online adaptation of the annual forum, HCQ TV. HCQ TV is an evolution of the skills we've been honing through our online engagement with consumers for over 18 months. And we are thrilled that you are here to participate in the first episode of our HCQ TV series today. While COVID continues to make planning difficult, we hope this series brings you some of the elements you've come to value in our annual forum. The importance of an effective health system has been more evident than ever since last year. The need for solid skills and knowledge in consumer partnerships has never been more critical. So on behalf of the Board of Health Consumers Queensland and our sponsors, the Queensland Government, we bring you this series to support the vital work you do. We trust it supports and inspires you and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Erin, and thank you to our board for supporting us to bring our annual event to you bigger and better than ever before. We're very pleased to be welcoming people from all across Queensland and even further beyond, I believe. It's fantastic to have the opportunity to be sharing these sessions with our interstate friends and counterparts. Welcome. So today we take a closer look at the evolution of consumer partnerships over the last 12 months moving to digital platforms. Has it been a bridge to greater engagement or has it been a barrier? Joining me today, we have three consumer representatives who have embraced the opportunities that digital engagement bring. Firstly, Jim Madden is a consumer representative dedicated to improving health outcomes in the Darling Downs region and a member of the Health Consumers Collaborative of Queensland. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Via video, we have John Anderson. John is an Aboriginal elder with wide ranging experience in areas such as health, disability, community services and advocacy, just to name a few. Also via video, we welcome Peter Tully, a West Morton consumer representative who shares his experiences of living with a disability to advocate for better health services. And then finally, our fourth guest is Dr Alex Markwell, Senior Staff Specialist at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital and outgoing chair of the Queensland Clinical Senate. Thank you all for joining us today. So it's not news to anyone that things took a very abrupt turn in 2020, as COVID made face-to-face -face consumer engagement impossible. Like many organisations, we here at Health Consumers Queensland did some quick thinking and worked out ways of engaging with our network of consumers and our partners in health. So John, I'd like to ask you the first question today. Had you taken part in any online consumer engagement activities before March 2020? And if no, why do you think that is? Well, thank you, Melissa, and thank you, Shannon, for the welcome to country. No, I didn't take part in, in um, any of the, the online consumer conversations. Um, however, as um, and from my, my background, Bungaroo the turtle. Um, you pick up pressures and waves and changes in community. So the pandemic created, if you like, some waves rippling through the community. And uh, those pressure waves, uh, to me, it was very clear that um, online uh, conversations uh, can be a barrier and, and needed to be a part of that. So embraced that and jumped into it. And um, certainly I found the, 
the, the straight shaft of the way that Health Consumers Queensland created these safe environments online for a conversation. Um, yeah, created an extra, extra tool to be used. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, John. And it's really great to hear that you, you found the spaces safe and, um, and valuable to join. We really appreciated your contribution. Uh, Jim, um, as an older member of our community, you're one of a cohort who people tend to think of as being unable or even sometimes unwilling to access technology. Yet in the past year, we have seen more of you than ever before and it's been a delight. How did you find the transition to online engagement and was there anything that made that transition easier? Well, first of all, I'd like to salute all our Indigenous brothers and sisters wherever we're being broadcasted to. Thanks very much for that question. When you ask that question, I think of myself of being born on the wrong side of the digital divide. Um, when I think back to my first encounters with uh, computerised technology, I think of the uh, computer that was stored in the University of Queensland back in the 1960s. And it took up about three rooms. And I shook my head and said to myself, well, I'll never have to use one of those things. Little did I know. And it was nearly 1980 before, you know, the PCs became available and I had to use one. So I just had to put my nose down and learn how to use it and to prove to myself that it wasn't impossible to cross the digital divide, though we didn't talk about it in those terms in those days. I think that some of the barriers I found were, first of all, that things move so quickly with computers. You know, 1960, you've got a big computer taking up three rooms. Uh, 1980, you've got a desktop computer and uh, laptops floating around. And now, you know, you have... It's in the wrong pocket. <laughs> but uh, you have your phone, and it's got just about everything on it. it. It boggles the mind. I think, you know, the one of the things I tried to do was to learn the logic of computers. And the main, main thing about the logic of computers is that you do everything step by step. And if you know what the steps are and the sequences of the step, you can't go wrong. The trouble is, I think that uh, computers and computerized communication technology has expanded so far, and there are so many tracks and there are so many changes in those tracks that you get lost in it and you just have to stick at it until you can fiddle around and eventually somehow it drops through. Um, having said that, I think that, uh, you know, when uh, computers and communication were put together, uh, we saw, you know, in a, a private capacity, very little of that. And my introduction to it was, um, that, uh, you know, that computers are likely to be mysterious kind of machines that will jump out and eat you. Uh, I think the other thing is that, uh, you know, uh, we relied a lot on skills and memory in my time through schools and uh, we didn't like the idea of being a failure. And I think, uh, you know, a lot of older people, they were scared to take it on because they thought, well, I might get lost and people think I'm a silly old dilly trying to cope with that thing. But I suppose the other thing that encouraged me was seeing more highly motivated older people, more highly, mo more highly motivated than myself, go at it and master it. And I said, well, if they can do it, so can I. And I guess, you know, that... Uh, by uh, uh, knowing the logic, fiddling around and seeing the encouragement of other older people mastering it, that uh, I have uh, became acclimatised to it and I'm so glad I did. The other thing I'd like to say is that 
the beginning of last year, Healthcare Queensland put on a series, I think it was of four lessons uh, on using Zoom. And up until that time, I felt a bit diffident. We had uh, tried to have some uh, video uh, participants at some of our meetings in Toowoomba. They were okay, but nobody knew the technology. But to be able to learn how simple, really, the basics the, to be functional in using Zoom and Teams is, uh, that's an encouragement in itself, and I think we've gone a long way since there. Fantastic. Thanks, Jim. And you are a whiz now, and I'm sure you'd be able to deliver those online um, lessons for us to new consumers. Well, we'll have to organise that. <laughs> Um, so just a reminder for those of you listening online, um, please do drop your comments and, and chats in the box below. We'd really love to hear from you, your experience of this time um, and also any questions that you have for the panellists. So Peter, as someone with an IT background, you had a head start on using technology. Uh, what are the benefits of digital engagement and what are the disadvantages? Okay, thank you. Um... Melissa, and thank you for the opportunity to help consumer Queensland and for the welcome to the country to be involved in today's forum. Um, yes, Melissa, you're right. I had a head start with technology, but believe it or not, as an IT guy, I still had some challenges having to adapt to what was lying ahead because we had no idea when we started the digital platform, where we're gonna go or what we're gonna happen. So just quickly, some of the challenges I had was, I had to upgrade my office to make sure that I had a reliable MBN connection. I had to upgrade my camera to make sure that it was good quality camera because some of the people that I work with do things like lip reading or sign language or different things like that. And then I had to upgrade my screen. So for example, this morning, I've got what's going on on one screen and I've got the live interview on the other screen. So I had to set myself up. So I just wanted to make it clear that even people who were in the technology game, they too had challenges. The second part of your question, what were the benefits? of digital engagement. I think the benefit is that we've all learned the potential of technology far quicker than we would have if it wasn't for the COVID season. And what do I mean by that? There are so many meetings now online or, or done differently because of what we've all learned over the last year and a half. And I think, you know, all of us have a role to help everyone as a consumer or someone in the community have a role to help people get used to technology, especially as we continue to launch into the potential of things like telehealth. Um, we know that starting and I can see bigger and huge potential for that. And I'm looking forward to where that goes. What are the disadvantages? Melissa, I think you have a pretty fair idea of one of them I'm going to say is, is that I probably similar to yourself and others online today, I do a lot of back-to-back -back meetings. So I finish one meeting, I go to the next one. I go to the next one and so on. So the downside of disadvantages are that we're not getting that walk up the road to grab a cup of coffee or to just make those couple of quick phone calls or to just say hello to somebody. We seem to be much more busier in the digital world jumping from event to event. 
Yep, absolutely. And one of the biggest things I miss, um, and this is giving away my secrets to those in Queensland Health that I work with, but I always have a little list of um, things that I want to um, harass. I mean, talk to people at the meeting about, and I don't get to do that anymore unless I'm face to face. So yeah, there's yeah. benefits and disadvantages. Um, so uh, my next question is for Alex, um, and we've talked about how um, digital technology has really well, consumers have told us that um, uh, digital engagement has democratised engagement, and I'm, sh I'm sure that you've heard that. Um, how can we continue to facilitate sharing power um, in digital engagement? Uh, look, I think it's a, a great question, uh, Melissa, and it, it's something that we didn't actually anticipate at the time, and. Um, we, as a um, chair of the Clinical Senate, our Senate meetings were quite traditional. They were, they were fairly large face-to-face -face events going over several days. Um, obviously wonderful opportunities for people to network and, um, and meet face-to-face -face and do all those things that you were talking about before. Um, but obviously with COVID we had to pivot as well. And we did move to the online platform, which we were nervous about initially. We weren't sure how that would go. Um, but uh, in fact, it was Erin who suggested um, that we really look at that as an option. And we're, we're just so glad that we did. Um, you know, we had a few teething problems as, as, anyone, um, as anyone would. And one of the things we realised early on is that you really do need to have everyone online or in the room. It's, it's, it is quite challenging to do a hybrid um, version. Uh, but once we had established that, by having um, the platform and the, the nature of uh, our the way we hold our forums and the fact that everyone can um, enter comments in real time, they can type their own um, thoughts and reflections as we go, there's the opportunity to like or dislike um, and respond in real time to comments without being rude or, inter or interrupting people, which is usually, you know, we usually wait and sit very patiently and quietly until the end of a presentation. So it made it much more interactive and we're actually much better able to capture uh, much more accurately, I suppose, um, all of our members' input, and that included our consumers and our consumer guests. And I think um, that the feedback we had from our consumers who attended was they felt uh, much more um, more likely to put down their, their true comments and their true feelings. They felt less inhibited. Uh, and although we try very hard to create a, a very safe environment, I completely understand how overwhelming it can be to be in a room full of clinicians. I get overwhelmed. Uh, so it's no wonder that having that, um, th this opportunity actually meant that uh, not just our consumers, but in fact, some of our clinicians as well felt more empowered and uh, more likely to, to put forward their views, which is what we really want. So um, we, we're really looking at how we can look at a, a hybrid um, approach going forward. So have um, perhaps one large face-to-face -face event a year, but then continue with the online virtual um, options for this reason, because it just gives us, it, it gives us, um, I suppose, a greater depth and breadth of input and also allows more people to attend. So we can actually have more consumers uh, and in fact, more clinicians involved as well. Mm -hmm. And a truly um, representative attendance from right across. Absolutely, the yeah. And I think even though my observations of one of your events was, I think the number of consumers participating was the same as face-to-face -face meetings, but their voices seemed to be much more amplified mm -hmm. and highlighted through through the technology. Mm -hmm. So thank you for being um, flexible and responsive and um, courageous to go with new technologies. Oh. <laughs> um, so, John, we've just been talking about the benefits um, of these technologies, but um, I'd like you to focus on who may be being left behind um, in all of this and what can health organisations, HCQ, um, do to bring in some of those people who have been left out so far of digital engagement? Yeah, thank you, Melissa. And, and look, it's, um, I'll borrow, borrow uh, from Alex there, the word courageous. Uh, I mean, it's uh, there's, 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 there's courage in looking in the rear view mirror and seeing those, those, seeing those left behind disappearing across the horizon, the rear view mirror. Um, growing up out in Western Queensland, um, um, the experiences out there, if you, if you just kind of go, going to go for a drive or a, for a game of footy or the like, um, that invariably driving from Bark Alden to, to, to Winton is, is uh, that's a three hour journey. We did that one year in the back of a back of a truck for the football grand finals. So mattress is the back of a, a, a cattle truck. We wouldn't do that these days, but that was a drive in the country. So people that are being left behind are, are those that are on the fringes, whether it's on the fringes of, of, of the economics, um, people that, that live from big payday to little payday, 
um, those who, who don't have the technology sitting there with 10-year-old mobile phones that aren't smart enough for too many things, as Jim's alluded to. The, um, those others then who, who don't have champions. Um, taking this more consumer-centred approach means that we don't look in the rearview mirror. We're mindful of who's around us. Um, we're, they're very clear. We, we can see them through the front screen, through the side screen. And there are no random acts of kindness because we're acting kindly all the time. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, that taking that thought and that movement around there. Um, the, the work that can be done, I mean, Health, and, Health Consumers Queensland in conjunction with Queensland Health have been quite creative and innovative. It's created a momentum. The danger for us is, is that those who haven't quite caught up to the journey so far are going to be left further behind unless there are particular efforts made on behalf of, of those key decision makers within the health system. Like any other part of, of, of Australian society, we, we are burdened by, uh, st burdened by the chains of system systemic racism, of that not understanding others and looking through other lens. Now that we've focused, um, focused eyes on the consumer lens, um, very, very optimistic, I, I believe there are gains to be made, as well as savings to be made, and efforts to be multiplied, uh, value-adding efforts to, to bring about um, meeting the aspirations and needs of all. So, uh, yeah, look, my, my message um, in, in this here is to, is to just say, look after each other. Uh, be mindful of each other, and let's do this journey together. And it's um, um, let's all share the decision making. Let's build this together. Hmm. Here, here. Melissa, well, can, can I just add to that, um, John? I think all those points that you you outlined are really crucial. But we've also got parts of Queensland where we don't even have reception. Um, yes. Where even if we had a mobile phone that had the smarts. We, we don't have the bandwidth. We don't even have mobile phone reception. And mm. so there are still some incredibly basic parts of um, our infrastructure that haven't yet been um, uh, addressed to enable, um, you know, obviously consumer engagement is important, but all aspects of um, communicating with our consumers and our patients and our system as well. Mm, mm. Yep, absolutely. Great. Um, Great. 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 Well, can I just, just, just add on to that one? So. Um, this whole country, as Shannon's alluded to, there are still ancient trading routes that are being used. And those ancient trading routes, uh, routes um, were also used for health purposes. And those trading routes existed before the World Wide Web. In fact, I think Murray and Island people, we had the first very, very first World Wide Web because a lot of that happened through intuition, through minds, through knowing ceremonies and reading signs in landscape. So this exists out there. So if we, if we look at the Northern Territory borderline, there is information that gets shared between Mount Isa and Birdsville well before the postman, well before someone picks up the phone to get it. These ancient ways of doing are still there. And I think this is the value add that comes when we engage with First Peoples um, in ways that, that delivers the benefits for all, because we don't live in these communities. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. Thanks, John. And Peter, you had a comment to add? Yeah, I, I was just going to add to what Sophie said. The, the other thing is that we need to remember that it's good on one side that technology has grown to the potential that it has. But unfortunately, our MBN structure within the whole of Australia, not just out west, because as I said in my first question, even I had unreliable MBN connection in the area where I am, uh, we have a long way to go now to get our MBN to a reliable connection right across Australia. So technology has overtaken what our MBN was capable of. 
That's correct. And thank you to our panel for being patient while we struggled with our internet in the office <laughs> yesterday. We're all <laughs> struggling to improve how we work. Um, it also makes me think, John, that um, yes, digital brings Jeez. benefits. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the system must oh, look I'm at closing sorry. that digital divide and oh, ensuring that individuals, yeah. that communities have access to the technology um, that Peter described um, to the internet like we've talked about. But um, is it also that perhaps uh, digital is an added, it is an evolution in terms of engagement for us, but it doesn't replace other mechanisms um, that work for and perhaps maybe better for um, many members of our society, um, say face-to-face, -face, kitchen table conversations. Um, could you talk about that? Yes, the, the digital divide um, is, uh, it can be a barrier, um, but, but so is difference. And I think some of the approaches that we've taken um, through Health Consumers Queensland, um, again, those ancient ways of doing business, so yarning circles, yeah? Having these yarning circles and we're meeting people in culturally safe spaces, that we're doing this, doing this business. And um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to blow a trumpet here. Um, facilitating an enterprise bargaining agreement between Himba Yumba, a uh, school at, at, um, at Springfield, and the Independent Education Union of, of Queensland and Northern Territory. It's the first time in an industrial arena in the education setting that this old practice of yarning circles is being deployed. It's quicker and um, it, we're doing it in half the time with half the resources and it is such a happy yarning circle way of doing business. So uh, again, coming back to that point of let's look at these different ways of doing, doing business here. And um, yeah, look, just tapping on, on, on what um, uh, Peter shared with us there is, is that the, the digital or the, or the distance isn't the barrier, it's the differences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm only 400 metres from, from uh, Prince Charles uh, Hospital and it's the worst reception, yeah? Yeah. I send a carrier pigeon across there whenever I need a Uber. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. And as you said before, we have so much to learn from First Nations people about better ways of working. Um, so just a reminder again for everyone, we do have some questions and comments coming through, which I'll share in a moment. So um, thank you, but um, please keep them coming. Um, so we've got a comment there from Deb. Uh, Deb observed that um, the Zoom platform gave us a more um, structured way to network um, in a way that social media isn't always, uh, to network, to question and uh, to discuss issues at a deep level um, with nuances of tone of voices um, that sometimes Sometimes quite difficult to, to get a sense of in, in the written word. Um, so she hopes that we can meet physically again. So do we. Um, we held our youth forum face to face for the first time last week and it was amazing uh, to connect so many incredible young people and key decision makers within the system. Um, so it will happen again um, when it's safe to do so. Uh, but in the meantime, um, Deb's talking about taking that spirit of face to face sharing and that depth of understanding further and um, and welcoming that opportunity to um, create new friendships um, that we saw thrive um, through our consumer conversations. So thanks, Deb. <laughs> um, so Alex, I'd like to um, uh, go back to you to deep dive into uh, the Clinical Senate forum that you held online um, around um, you, the transition of young people from um, child and youth health services through to adult services. Uh, and uh, it was almost ready to go just before COVID hit, needed to be postponed, and then you were able to hold it online in December 2020. Uh, we, we all heard some incredibly moving stories from young people uh, that were then instrumental in informing um, the report and the recommendations that are aimed at improving healthcare for young people. Um, and you've talked about um, uh, your learnings um, from, um, from that time, your motivations and your learnings. Um, was, there, was there any kind of different support that you provided uh, to the consumers to ensure that they were able to participate um, effectively? And uh, were there any surprises or um, uh, any um, unexpected benefits that um, you took away from mm -hmm. that process? Um, thanks, Melissa. And I guess, um, you know, we're, if we just reflect on where we are now compared to last year, we're in such a different place. And you're right, we had our Adolescent to Young Adult Care um, forum teed up for the end of March. 
And at the beginning of the March, uh, beginning of um, that month, we were starting to get more and more nervous. And um, we, at one point, were looking at some of the modelling, which was quite catastrophic about what we would potentially be facing in the first week of April. And in, in that setting, we really made a decision um, that w it wouldn't be responsible a, for us to continue. And that was just before the lockdown and all those other restrictions occurred. Um, but when they obviously came in place, there was no way we could proceed. Uh, but we also knew that people just weren't in the right headspace at the moment or at that point, all we could think about um, was COVID. And it was, it, was, it was really tough because it was such an important topic and the organising committee and our consumers had invested so much time and effort into getting um, the program ready that it was really tough to have to say, look, we're going to have to at least delay, if not cancel, because we really didn't know what was going to happen over the next 12 months. Yeah. Um, and so although that was um, tough, everyone understood. Uh, and in fact, we pivoted pretty quickly because it wasn't long after that that we pulled together an online forum to explore some of the immediate issues that we were faced with COVID. And then um, we had a, another online forum in May where we were looking at innovation and, and some of the other um, amazing things that had happened as a, as a benefit of COVID. Who would have thought that there would actually be some good things that came out? Um, and I guess I just wanted to reassure um, that consumers who are online as well, that um, it wasn't just uh, consumers perhaps who maybe hadn't adopted digital platforms. Um, clinicians were terrible at it. We, none of us really knew how to use Teams and everyone would, you know, we'd be muting and unmuting and it, we were all pretty bad at it. But um, it, it, we, we, were, we were really forced to learn quickly how to become skilled at it. And so um, we went from being very... Uh, virtual platform naive to becoming uh, much more comfortable and it uh, it opened us up. We became pretty skilled across multiple platforms. You know, are we going to Zoom? Are we going to um, Teams? What's our platform today? And uh, it meant that a whole group of us had a, a skill set um, that we certainly didn't expect that we would have had. Um, so by the time we came to the Adolescent to Young Adult Care meeting, um, which we held at the end of the year, which was uh, we were able, the fact that we were able to do that was great. We're in a space where people could think about things that were non-COVID related, which was great. Um, we were able to adapt the original program and what we found that we could actually cover nearly all of the same content that we would cover in a day and a half in a four hour online session. Now, it, it was, it's very, very intense. Those sessions are exhausting. Um, we have to make sure that there are, there are breaks in there so people can go and get a drink and go to the bathroom or do all those things. But we also have to try and keep people engaged because four hours is, is a long time, um, especially when we're talking about such important topics with such intensity and to ensure that we're giving the respect to our presenters as well. So, so I think we're still working our way through how to best balance that. Um, and each meeting is a little bit different and we, we take home um, some messages with that. But one of the key points we had from feedback and learnings from our earlier meetings was pre-briefing our consumers was really important and we've been so grateful and um, blessed to have the um, support of Health Consumers Queensland to, to really assist with that. Um, making sure that we had um, tech support during the meeting if, if there were any issues and so in addition to the chat line, the forum, we'd have a WhatsApp group going and we'd have all, like, <laughs> we'd have all these technology um, options going and I'd have screens going everywhere. And I have to be honest, by the end of those sessions, I was completely screened out and just needed to not look at a screen for a little while. Um, but we, we did have a support network and it meant we got the most out of um, our participants. And I hope that we were able to um, ensure that our consumers felt really well supported. Mm. Uh, and also, um, as I said, our clinicians as well, they were learning on the run um, also. And so uh, that actually meant that we all started at the same place and that made it, um, that really flattened the playing field and uh, I, I think helped to that um, point about democratisation. Um, I think that that was a key, a key issue as well. Mm. So look, I, I think, um, Although the benefits of the face-to-face -face are fabulous, um, the fact that we can still cover these important topics and, and do it in a different way means that I don't think we'll go back. Um, there's also the other benefits around, um, you know, there are financial savings, but there's also the environmental impact as well that is lessened by having, not having to fly people uh, and so on. Um, and I think that's really important that we consider those aspects, um, you know, going forward. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Thanks, Alex. 
Um, now, Jim, to move um, back to you, so we've been talking about engagement, but also how healthcare was delivered, was rev revolutionised with greater access to telehealth, um, uh, to online appo uh, um, appointments, either via telephone or digital. Um, there were challenges, weren't there, for um, especially older people living in residential aged care facilities. Um, what could um, aged care facilities do now to digitally connect um, older residents, uh, many of whom have had minimal contact or even sometimes nil face-to-face -face contact with their loved ones? Um, what more could those facilities be doing? Um, look, I'm talking here more as a teacher than as a consumer representative. Um, in my last years of teaching, computers and computerised technology was flooding schools and kids from the time they started schools were learning keyboards and things like that. I think facing up to a keyboard is one of the fears that older people have, uh, particularly those that uh, may have done the uh, commercial course with the nuns in their schools and had to have their fingers in a certain position and all the rest of it. But um, when I saw this question, when I heard it, I was reminded of those two um, programs that have been on television where they introduced the young people to the older people in the homes. Mm. And we saw the change that came in those people. Mm. Now, these young people, they're a bit older, I suppose, than the ones I'm thinking of here, have those skills and they've learned them like a second language. And, you know, I've seen them go into their grandfathers and their grandmothers and uh, uh, aged aunts and all the rest of it and say, look, Grandpa, this is what you do, etc., etc." My brother, he was presented with a new um, telephone, new uh, mobile, and uh, he didn't have a clue. And his little granddaughter come along and said, Grandpa, well, this is what you do. You touch that and you touch that and you touch that. And he said, look, you're going too fast for me. And it was a good learning experience for both of them because my grandniece, she had the information, but she didn't know how to present it. And my brother, who needed that information, he was able to tell the uh, grandniece how to present it. And in that way, you know, the com communication link was formed between them. So my advice to anyone dealing with older people, get the young people that have got this into their fingers from the day they started school, if not before, to come along and take them through the steps. And if they're going too fast for you, just say, can we go just a little bit slower? And do you mind going over that again and again? Don't be frightened, frightened of repetition. Take it easy and you'll get there. Get scared of it and you'll get nowhere. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Reminds me of me asking my teenage daughters to show me how to use Instagram. Um, but they don't know how to use Facebook, so it can work in the opposite <laughs> direction as well. Um, Peter, I'd love to um, ask you about your experience. Um, so you engage with HHSs as a representative um, on hospital and health service uh, committees. And um, it also Correct. sounded like you are connected in with a broad network of other health consumers and carers. Could you talk about how um, online engagement how um, Zoom and Teams um, possibly changed the way um, that you um, partnered uh, with all of those people and uh, supported your advocacy and your, your shared goals? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question, Melita. And just to add to Jim's comment from before, um, I, I really believe that one of the things we all need to do with technology it makes sure we bring everybody on the journey with it. I can't tell this audience, Melissa, how many people I have helped in exactly what Jim has described, including Jim, so he just put his <laughs> hand up, including Jim. Um, I can't tell you how many people I have helped through this pandemic season that it 
one thing to give someone a bit of technology, but like Alec was saying before, everybody was on a learning curve about the best way to run a meeting, what the difference was between Microsoft Zoom or Skype or, or Microsoft Teams. And I think we all need to remember that there's a lot of people out there that are still waiting to go on that journey that Jim's been talking about. And so it's one thing to throw a bit of technology, but we need to make sure, okay, Peter, do you, you've got this technology now, do you know how to engage with it? Um, so that, that's my, now with, with regard to your question around networking and engaging with, with other organizations, I think one thing that this technology has done is it brought us all closer together. So what do I what do I mean by that? You know, you know as well as I do, and some of the audience listening today, they all know that we've done some really good projects with other partners like Queenslanders with a Disability Network, um, like. Uh, PHN, the Primary Health Network, and so on. And I think if we can embrace networking and partnershiping together mm. using technology, I think there's some, a lot more great projects that will come out of that networking and collaboration, especially if we make sure that we bring everybody on the journey with us. It's one thing to come up with an idea, let's do this, but hey, let's make sure we bring all those people on the journey with us and make sure that they're at the same level with regard to technology as what some of the experienced people are mm. to some of the ones that are not so experienced. Absolutely. And it was great to see Queenslanders with Disability Network and um, uh, also ourselves um, take on that work to, and, and yourselves as members of the consumer movement to take on that responsibility <coughs> to, to bring people along. Um, I'll ask um, Alex about her experience of um, uh, working in partnership with us in a minute, but um, I thought I would, um, you know, this work is about, yes, sharing our successes, but also our less um, than fine moments. And um, uh, in terms of learning, around the use of technology from this time, you might like to hear about my experience of being on a um, uh, Teams meeting with a number of um, high-level people from right across the department and the HHSs, and I discovered that my bathroom was flooded, and I was not on mute as I um, exclaimed very loudly uh, <laughs> when I discovered it. So, But I think that those moments actually do help you develop your partnerships and your relationships. You know, we're all human. Um, but Alex, thank you for being a part of um, what were at one stage of the pandemic twice weekly uh, teams meetings between several of the key consumer organisations, us Queenslanders with Disability Network, CODA Queensland, Palliative Care Queensland, um, ADA uh, and yourself. Um, could you describe um, your experience of, of those sessions? Meeting. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. And just just to that previous comment, I think um, it's a it's a worldwide phenomenon that has acknowledged um, working from home and and having Zoom meetings has actually made us a lot more human and and perhaps facilitated that connection. And I know um, last year because my children um, seemed to have an endless string of colds and were often at home, and so I would work from home and they would just come in and out of the office and wave at people and try and interact with you know, the chief health officer or whoever was speaking at the time. Um, and, I, you know, I try and take my camera off. But they, they loved it and it actually meant that they could see what I was doing at work. But it actually meant that the people who I worked with could see um, what else I do when I'm not at work. Uh, and so I think it, it helped. It really does help build those relationships, um, particularly when we're not meeting face to face. And um, when you're trying to build a relationship for the first time on a virtual platform, that's pretty hard. It, it's a bit easier if you had a pre-existing relationship that you're, you're working from. But um, I, I, I really loved that. I thought that that particular meeting was great. Um, you were alive. <laughs> I'm, I'm sad that your, your, um, your bathroom got flooded, but it was, it was all good. Um, so back to, the, back to the, the actual question, which was around that collaboration with the um, other stakeholders. Um, look, I, I think uh, it was a really fantastic example of true collaboration. And the Clinical Senate has always um, talked about how we can better um, engage and connect with um, consumers to improve care. 
It's about connecting clinicians, but also um, connecting with consumers. And um, we found pretty early on last year that when things got stressful, it, it became harder to, um, to engage with clinicians and it became harder to engage with uh, consumers. And we, we both had that experience where, um, you know, previous mechanisms and meetings and forums where we would, you know, receive information, be able to provide input, um, those, those meetings were all stopped because everyone was in crisis mode. Um, and so we, we were doing these other, you know, developing other forms and other um, ways that we could connect and share information. And uh, I still think that we were um, well ahead of um, probably many of our colleagues interstate. And I had a network of colleagues that I would go out to to find out, you know, what's happening in Victoria, New South Wales? What, tell me what you're doing. And they're like, oh, we, don't, we don't know. Um, and I know that we, we had similar experiences when we were trying to get intelligence about different aspects and policy development. Um, it was really hard to tell. So I think that was a wonderful example and thank you for your leadership in bringing that together and thank you for the partners who um, would dial into those meetings and I know um, that I didn't get to all of them every time uh, but it was really it was really important for me to hear what was going on and also for me to be able to impart information um, that sometimes I would have that um, that we that wasn't necessarily public yet but was still really important to share um, and we still do have those um, meetings although they're less frequent I still think they're an incredible um, incredibly valuable opportunity for us to to share information and um, for example, we still know that um, vaccin COVID vaccination of people with disability, particularly in residential um, settings, is woefully behind where it should be. Uh, and, and so having that direct information really assists with advocating for a, a, a strategy to try and address that. Yeah, yeah, identifying those shared priorities and going out and sharing the same message, message and going Absolutely. to who we had access to was yeah. really, really powerful. Yeah. So um, we've got a comment from online. Um, you'll be pleased to hear this, John. Um, Jan reports um, that she's pleased to announce that yarning circles have not long started up in the Bundaberg area, so that's great, um, feeding through the voice of consumers on the ground. Um, and there's another question here for the consumer panellists from Lucy. Lucy is wondering if you think if technology has literally placed the power in the consumer's hands? And that's a really great question mm -hmm. because um, our, our um, theme for this series is um, the, the power of sharing power. Um, so would any of the consumer members like to respond to that? Has technology literally placed the power in the consumer's hands? I'd like to say that uh, I think it's a work in progress. Um, I've been a, a consumer representative now for about six years and I, I felt that the hospitals, well the hospital that I work in, isn't as yet acclimatised at dealing with people who are entering into their domain but don't fully belong to them as employees and they kind of tend to dominate what consumers do as though, you know, you do this and you do that. Mm -hmm. But I think consumers are saying to them, look, we're not here to be pushed about. We're here to give you feedback from the things we're doing and uh, we think we've got something to say and we'd like to offer it through our channels, not the channels that you put down for us necessarily. Mm -hmm. So I think to that extent, yes, there's... Uh, a growing power being uh, adopted by consumers and I think that that is adding to the enrichment of hospital practices through the feedback that we're able to give them. Mm. Mm. Thanks Jim. John or Peter? Yes, uh, yeah, well said, Jim. And um, I, I think it's uh, calling this calling this out for what 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 it is. So, uh, from from a, a First Nations consumer representative um, perspective, or not even a representative, um, as, as an Aboriginal man, um, the truth telling that we're now a part of, um, there's nowhere that can be hidden. That once you've got consumers sitting around the table and something is said that it happens this way, well. There's that greater opportunity now for consumers to say, "Well, that look, that doesn't exactly happen like this, like you've described. Through my lens, it, it happens this way." 
So, so there, there is, I'm not sure whether it's a greater power or a transfer of power, but more uh, around a more equitable way of, of doing business. Mm -hmm. And it's pleasing to see that, uh, that, that uh, the recent uh, passing of legislation around health equity, um, this coupled with um, the consumer, rising power of consumers and the like, I think, um, and having a, a, a Queensland Human Rights Bill in there for a while now, um, I believe that there's going to be some redistribution of energies um, and maybe a better better investment or, or a reinvestment of the $18 billion that sits in the health system here in Queensland. Um, there are lots of savings that can be generated, but then working with, with consumers and communities um, allows for a, a greater influencing of the redistribution of, of of health resources and talent and skills and expertise and knowledge, um, it makes for a better, better and stronger and healthy, more more culturally vibrant communities. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. And um, before I throw to you, Peter, could I? John's prompted me to take this question further. Um, this idea of sharing power. In your experience, do you think um, that it requires health services to give up power? And if so, what do you think creates the conditions for them to be willing to do that so that consumers, so that the, the power is in the consumer's hands to shape the system? Um, look, having served, served time in, 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 in social policy with Peter Beattie, one of the phrases that, 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 that reside in my mind after that with Glyn Davis and Peter Bidgeman is frank and fearless. So we can talk around this, we can pussyfoot, but once we get on the dance floor, there are going to be some toes trodden on. So let's have this frank and fearless conversation. Let's, let's have a conversation about the music that we're going to dance to, the type of dance it is, and let's do this together. Otherwise, there's going to be some toes stood on the like, and there are going to be injuries, and people are going to get hurt from this. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it, there's this opportunity, I know, with recent changes in in the Hospital Health Services Board um, legislation as well too, that a requirement to have um, um, at least two Aboriginal people, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people on health boards. Uh, but that's that's a benchmark. There's nothing saying, say in Torres and Cape, of a greater number because of the greater population there. Let's be creative with this and meet communities where they're out and let's not be be um, bound up in in... In, um, in, in power structures and, and shortened conversations. Mm. Let's enjoy the richness of this because this humanity, this, this new reaching into our own humanity, forced into this through, through, through COVID-19 and the like, is refreshing. Um, I'm getting lessons from my, my grand, grandchildren as well too, online. Um, my six-year-old grandson was, was twirling a fire stick for the first time and um, it doesn't take away the fear from sitting and watching that as a grandparent. Um, my fear would be heightened if I was right there. But having confidence that there are safe places and safe conversations to be had and we are all going to be all the better for this, but let's, let's not design people out of process. Let's not exclude. Nelson Mandela said that one of the greatest things that he had was every time someone drew a circle to exclude him, he drew a bigger circle to include, yeah? Mm. I love it. I just saw a quote um, yesterday that said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring your own fold-up chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Peter, did you have any comments? Yes, so I, I think, just to import what Jim and John have just been talking about, I think one thing that the online technology has done it's allowed consumers to be in bigger numbers. Mm -hmm. So I think because we have bigger numbers, we have bigger voice. But not only do we have bigger numbers, we have bigger variety. So what do I mean by variety? My specific interest, as you all know on the panel today, my specific interests are advocacy, health, and uh, NDIS along with disability. So they are my strength that I bring as a consumer. John's strength will be different to mine and Jim's strength will be different to John and mine. So 
not only do we have bigger numbers, but we have bigger representation around the different topics that we're talking about, whether it's mental health, whether it's youth, whether it's, you know, um, drug and alcohol or whatever. So that, that's what I think we need to make sure that we continue to take everybody on the journey as we've got those bigger numbers. Mm, absolutely. And the online technology made it so easy for us to ensure that we heard from such a wide, diverse range of consumers. So then we could feed that through to the system to shape the pandemic response. It's it's tricky, isn't it, when you're one or two consumer representatives on a committee um, trying to bring the perspectives of many and there are some for whom you can't you can't speak for. Because mm. Melissa Peter here, one of the highlights I remember, and I don't know if you remember it, is when we had 120 people on one of the forums that you were leading. <laughs> and I think John was there and I think Jim was there. And that was a very proactive meeting. I'm sorry, I can't remember the title, but as you said that, as you said what you just said, that reflected back in my memory that that I think there was 120 odd people mm. on that forum. Mm. Incredible numbers. And and we have been really fortunate, as Alex says, so many things that have happened here haven't happened in the rest of the country. To have the strategic communications branch of the department, um, to have um, the, the um, public health physicians, um, to have primary care representatives, to have the chief health officer um, come along to our forums and be in conversation and want to know what you um, had to share. It was um, it was really fantastic. Um, so, um, Jim, uh, do you think that we should go back to how we did engagement prior to 2020? Um, well, I'm all tempted to say the answer to that question is yo. Um, <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> I do like the face-to-face -face meetings and that's personal preference. I think there's a kind of a cosiness there and you can come along before the meetings and have a little bit of well, what I'll call fellowship and then, you know, you can pack up your briefcase and walk with somebody from the meeting back to your car and things like that. Um, but I do appreciate the uh, extensiveness with which uh, we can use these digital platforms Particularly, say, in our region, I noticed there before uh, somebody was talking about a hybrid meeting. I'm going to a hybrid meeting of our regional council tomorrow, and uh, what I say by that is we have the meeting in Toowoomba, but we've got 17 hospitals in the region, and each of those has a, a consumer advisory group, and not all of them, but a lot of them now are coming in on Zoom or Teams. Uh, teams, I think, we've changed to now. And what we miss out on our coziness, we're able to involve far more people. So I like them both. And just the, the last point I'd like to make, if I know people, I feel I can work better with them. And it doesn't matter then whether they're in the same room or they're in the Zoom. And I give as my witnesses, both Paul and John, that I've got to know. And it's just like talking to them across the back fence here today. <laughs> Thanks, John. And um, uh, the point, there was a point in, um, uh, someone made a point in the comments about the hybrid model and um, advice on how Queensland Health or any health services can make it better. Uh, We've all attended a lot of them, and I think it's down to um, making sure that the technology works as well as possible prior to the meeting. Uh, it's terrible when issues are trying to be ironed out during the meeting, but chairing plays such a big role in whether the hybrid model works. And um, chairs who make an effort with each agenda item to go to those online to seek their feedback, to really include them, um, that mitigates the challenges of, of having um, the hybrid model. And I think the hybrid model is here to stay, uh, especially with the possibility, as we've seen in Melbourne at the moment, of community outbreaks at any time. We need to make sure um, that uh, people can uh, zoom in from home if, if they want to. Um, so, um, Peter, what would you like to stay um, in terms of online engagement? What would you like us to stick with? 
I think I think the main thing that we need to stick with, Melissa, is make sure that we continue to bring bring consumers on the journey with it. Because as I said, as I said in a couple of my little earlier comments, some consumers are right up there with technology and really getting on board. Others are in the middle, still trying to work it out, whether Microsoft Teams or whether it's Zoom or whether it's Skype or whatever. And then, and then you've got others that are right in there with it. And, and I think because consumers can be powerful with bigger numbers, as I mentioned just before, mm. I think it, I think consumers who are doing well in this space, we have a responsibility to engage other consumers and bring on new consumers to bring them up to um, technology standards. But also, like Jim said, there are times when I would love to see Jim and John face to face and including you guys as well, mm. you know? So making sure we keep that balance as we engage with consumers that maybe, like we've done today, we've got some people face to face and we've got some people online. Mm. So maybe as we move forward, as the uh, COVID situation we learn to live with COVID because I don't believe we will ever go back to the old norm that we knew in 2019. Mm, mm. I think we've got to learn to live with COVID. But as we do, we need to learn how to adjust technology and face-to-face -to, -face to keep that balance so that people have options and choices mm. around how they engage and when they engage and where they engage. Mm, that's great. Thanks, Peter. And it reminds me of that principle that we all work from around choice and control. It's it's exactly that. And and not only do we as organisations and as you've said, um, you as health consumers um, take on that challenge uh, to support people in growing these skills, so too can the health services um, be creative. We saw um, a number of First Nations consumers and elders brought together um, in the boardroom of um, the Mount Isa um, Hospital um, uh, Executive Boardroom uh, to listen to a question and answer session that we hosted uh, with um, Dr Jeanette Young and Haleen Grogan, the Deputy Director General of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Division. And that was a fantastic example um, of where people could come together, um, hear information, feed questions through that were answered um, uh, by both of those key Queensland health representatives and um, be a part of this digital revolution and not, not left behind. Uh, so John, what would 2020 have looked like for you um, and for First Nations people if uh, digital engagement didn't happen? Um, thank you, Melissa. And look, this will be my, 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 my last little bit. I, I do have to leave. Um, what it would look for me would, would be, um, I think I wouldn't be as well informed. I wouldn't be as well, well connected. Uh, the, the forum that you just mentioned there, I would not have met um, a, an old extended family member there who, who changed my nappy in, nappies in the dormitory on Palm Island in, in the late 50s. Uh, when I was a baby, so uh, and, and going to Jim's point, Toowoomba being being a, a focal point for movement of peoples for a long time, 15 uh, consumer um, groups coming together and sitting that forum there, that connecting of, of people in that space there too is extremely important from a socio-cultural point of view, that, that cultural health and well-being. Um, yes, the, the 2020 has has created uh, has has uh, transacted a lot of lot of gifts, but it's also then um, as always we sit here with with privilege, um, but for for myself I sit here with obligations, and every time I sit in these spaces, um, my mind goes back to family, my heart and, uh, and and thoughts go with those who aren't in the conversation, and as we've experienced in here, uh, listening to Alex. Um, um, Peter and Jim and the like, I now, and yourself as well too, Melissa, I now sit with multiple lenses. Um, I, I think compa compound eyes like a fly on the wall. Yeah? <laughs> Wonderful. I must leave. Yeah. But 
thank you for the, for this opportunity. Thank you, John. It's always a privilege John. to have you with us. Bye, thank you. So we will wrap up the session there as well. Um, thank you so much, uh, everyone who's joined us today. Thank you to our wonderful panel members. It was a real delight to have this time to actually sit with each other, some face to face and some online, and reflect back on um, the amazing journey that we've all been on, uh, the relationships that we've developed, um, the impact that we've had. Uh, it's really quite moving. We still feel like we're in it every day because we are, but it's wonderful to have these opportunities to look back. So please, if you're online, join me in thanking all of our guests today. Uh, thank you also um, to our team at Health Consumers Queensland for pulling together uh, our first successful event of HCQ TV. Thank you to Select AV, um, where we are broadcasting from here in their studio, and thank you to Iceberg Events for the support that they are giving us in organising not our face-to-face -face forum this year, but um, these online events for you. Uh, so we hope you will join us for the rest of our series, uh, which you can read about on our event page, sharingpower2021.com.au. And tune in again on Thursday at midday for our second session, uh, where we will deep dive into co-design, uh, what it is not and how its success rests on sharing power. Thank you, everyone. See you then.